All right. So today I'm going to be talking about a lot of things, but I'm going to end up talking about shield walls that clashed at Plataea. As Janice just said, by training, I'm an entomologist. My PhD is in entomology. And I study swarm behavior in insects. And what that is, is that's any kind of behavior that derives from large groups working together. For instance, building a giant termite mound or defending the colony, finding food. And what I do for a living is I, I take a lot of the algorithms we derive from insects and I help people who are trying to make swarms of robots come up with uh, ways for, to make their robots work. Um, when we look at these swarms, one of the things you'll see is a, they can be highly, highly coordinated. And this coordination system here, for instance, here you see a, a murmuration of starlings and, and the manner in which they're moving would be the envy of any you know, cavalry officer, right? The manner in which they're coordinated is called self-organization. And self-organization is a system whereby individuals react to local conditions, the conditions right around them. Um, no one knows what's happening in the system. So if I'm a termite, I'm reacting to the termite next to me or the dirt in front of me. I have no idea what's going on around me. And uh, I don't know the overall state of the system. So I, if I'm building a mound with a termite, I don't have any idea what the actual mound looks like. I just know what's happening around me. And interestingly, that is what we see with hoplite warfare. We're specifically told by Thucydides that each man hardly knows anything except what's occurring around himself or to himself. And this is interesting to me because it's an intersection of the possibility for this self-organization with hoplite warfare. And you can see in the bottom here, this is one of the few um, human examples that everyone has seen before of self-organization. This is a wave going around a football stadium. And as you know, because you've probably done this, you don't actually you know, monitor the wave going around the stadium. You just stand up when the guy next to you stands up. So this is an example of self-organization. Well, can we apply these concepts to warfare in human swarms? And that's, that's really what I, I want to do. And I want to be able to derive information for you guys by applying these concepts to human swarms. So what can we learn from this type of experimentation? Well, I'm not a historian, I'm an experimental biologist. So from my point of view, what I wanna provide historians is context to understand the things that they're seeing. And this I think is something that's been sorely missing in many places because as we just talked about, you know, we, we don't know exactly what things look like. We, we can't, like, we don't have um, perfect firsthand accounts sometimes, but we may be able to reconstruct some of this. So we can provide some context, for instance, for how weapons and armor fit, how they feel. And Gianna says a lot of this. Um, we can provide context for how human bodies move when they're outfitted with this kit. We can provide context for how weapons are used. And we can provide context, and hopefully I, I'll show you some of this, for how masses of combatants move, how they coordinate their motion. There's a caution in this though. Experimentation and experiment, experiential narrative like this cannot tell us how something was done. I always stress this. It only suggests possibilities, but most importantly, it provides a context for the creation of new ideas on how things were done. Well, what can we do? Well, we can help explain things we see in art. For instance, it's commonly seen this helmet is up on the head like this and many people, have opined that this is just an artistic uh, means of showing the face, but this is literally the first thing you do if you're a hoplite, a Corinthian helmet, and you're hot, is you pull that helmet up off your face. Same thing with the armor. We see this armor in its characteristic pose constantly. This is the way you wear your armor when you're at ease and you don't really have a place to put it down, but you wanna get everything opened up so your body airs out. And as you can see, um, we all do this when we're reenacting. We can attempt to reconstruct weapons use. And in this, we're aided by more modern weapon styles. Like for instance, the Philippine Moros, the Moro people of the Philippine have the most aspis looking shield I've ever seen on the planet other than the aspis. And we can look at the way they use that shield and spear. And then um, there are back in the uh, 
Renaissance, we have the Bolognese masters, Marozzo and Manciolino, who both advocated the use of a double grip shield and spear, and we see what they did. But of course, those are separate systems. They're only analogies, and we have to sort of merge them with what we see through the artwork. And there's a beautiful statuette up there uh, from the Louvre where you see uh, the positions of two hoplites fighting a duel. We can also do weapons testing. So you can see, for instance, if you ask the question, can I put a dory through multiple layers of glued linen? Yes, the answer is you can. Can I do it through leather and linen? Sure. We can actually do it through bronze. So the short answer with weapons testing with the spear is that the spear goes through anything that a man could have worn on a hoplite battlefield. Um, does it go through, uh, you know, easily? Not always. You have to have a clean strike. Most of the strikes in combat were probably not clean, full strength strikes, but jabs. But this will show you an example of what you what you can do in testing. The best way to use the scientific method here for me, I think, is to undergo falsification. So rather than say, hey, you can do this because I can do it in hop like gear. And so surely they did that, which is a mistake. It's a rabbit hole that you can fall down into. Better is to take statements that other people have made because those statements are essentially, you know, making the same mistake. Right? So if you take a statement somebody else made, you can try to falsify it. And if you can't falsify it, then it's support for the statement. If you can falsify it, well, then uh, obviously that brings to the question its validity. Um, the problem with this, of course, is that there's the garbage in, garbage out concept. All testing is built on assumptions, and they're only as good as that foundation. So the common assumptions of modern testing is that we're actually using accurate reproductions of the technology. This will vary, of course. Uh, you know, in terms of how much work you put into it to make them that accurate. The other thing is that we have we assume that human subjects will respond in a similar manner physically, emotionally, and mentally as ancient people. Now, physically, obviously, we're generally tend to be larger. It's hard to assess the emotional and mental impact. Um, but overall, I think it's close enough that you can do a lot of falsification. Here's an example of falsification. So. There are many that say that hoplites can't charge fast in dense raids. So here you can get a bunch of hoplites together. You can put them in dense ranks and make them run. It's probably over hundred meters we ran here. And you can see that staying together in dense ranks is not very difficult. Here we have a, a statement for instance. The, this was made by Logan Bill. The charge made a literal clash of lines inevitable since rapidly advancing heavily armed formations of hoplites would have to halt abruptly in its tracks to support, to avoid a collision. So here we're saying that if you have men moving in formation, they can't stop abruptly. And that's something, of course, we can falsify. And this gives you an example of how sometimes you have fortuitous accidents in this testing for this hoplite here in the front who tripped over his sandal, who may or may not be me, fell down <laughs> in the middle of a charge. And as you see, everyone stopped rapidly. There was, no, uh, there was never a time when the men behind him were going to pile up and fall over and things like that. Hoplites could stop relatively rapidly. The, the trick is you have to know how to charge. And that's the kind of thing that we learn through this reenactment. Uh, if you charge so that you're practically leaning on the guy's back in front of you, then you're more likely to trip. But they almost surely didn't charge that way. We instead leave a gap between the lines of maybe six feet. And then just as you don't crash into a car every time you come to a red light, because you see the red lights on the back of the car and stop, these hoplites are able to judge the speed of the, car, of the hoplite in front of them and stop in time, and they don't just pile up and crash. Now, I guess if I were, oh, let me, I'll show you this, I'm sorry. Um, another question that arises, we just talked about it, is the frontage. So how much space does each hoplite take up in, in the line, right? So the, the sort of orthodox view on this is that there are uh, tightly packed hoplites somewhere between 60 and 90 centimeters. These are at 90 right now on the left because their shields are just touching, whereas if they were overlapped to a large degree, that could be as, as small as 60 centimeters. Uh, on the other side, the so-called heretics uh, led by Van Vries here uh, decided that they needed more room to fight than this. And this in some ways comes from some of the Roman uh, the writings of Polybius on Romans and how much frontage they uh, required. 
But if you put this to the test, and we did, the answer is pretty clear that you don't need much space at all. So the men who were set up at 180 centimeters not only lost these battles, they lost them rapidly. And the reasons become quite clear. So at 60 centimeters of frontage for these um, men here in full protective gear, you're still able to use your spear just fine. The spear as a weapon really only needs to go forward and back. So you're not hampered in any way. And then the problem is that you're stuck fighting multiple opponents on the other line if you are at this uh, wider spacing and you allow for more angles of impact because you're not protected at all by the men standing next to you. You're not you know, shaded by them and you're not protected by their spears more importantly, which would get in the way and hinder strikes. The, I'm sorry, like that, the, probably the most contentious issue that I could bring up um, and we could test would be a thismos, right? So a thismos is this mass pushing that is thought to either, I don't know why that's doing that there, hold on. That's thought to either occur or not occur. And um, if we look at the orthodox position on this, in battle, the opposing phalanx is charged while hundreds of meters apart, they crash directly into each other. They would get maybe one good thrust with a spear before they slammed into each other and their momentum from the charge added force to their pushing to one side gateway. On the opposite side, this was essentially dismissed and they say when battle came to close quarters, men didn't pack together, but they fought with these wide gaps, which I just showed you are probably unlikely. Um, and this allowed complex weapon play, which as I just showed you, you don't really need much room for complex weapon play. The battle was decided through spear and sword and any notion of pushing was figurative. Well, here's an example of how we can find a happy medium in a, a question like this through testing. So for instance, we look at the classic um, explanation of the thismos. This comes from Grundy back in 48. And he describes them coming into contact at the first instance, smashing into each other at that, with the momentum from that run. And then it becomes a giant rugby game where everybody's pushing. And this, this led to some issues on the other side because this clearly doesn't completely fit the narrative that we're reading. Uh, so it's been modified a little bit and sort of um, tweaked by many of the people who still believe in this sort of literal pushing, but there, the objections that we can come up with through experimentation are that this momentum concept does not actually hold true. So having momentum from a charge does not actually help you in the push because what matters in the push is how tightly packed you are. And that's really all that matters. So if you run as a large group uh, far distance and try to smash into one another, another, uh, let's say a formed line, uh, you cannot break that line. You can, you can literally hold up any number of men charging at you with at least four ranks of men. This is what we've discovered. So if you have four, sometimes three ranks of men, you can charge them with any number of ranks of men and they will just absorb the charge. And the reason is that same reason why you can get hit with a bean bag and it doesn't hurt, but if you got hit with a rock of the same mass, it would hurt is because that, that charge is diffuse when it hits. So whatever momentum individuals have is spent hitting the wall. And then once they're stopped, their body actually becomes something resisting the momentum of those individuals behind them. So the charge as the entree into a thismos really doesn't hold up uh, via experimentation. Also, spear strikes delivered at sort of a, a couched, you know, underarm strike like a lancer, like a horseless lancer are surprisingly weak. They're much, much weaker than just a regular overhand strike, even a standing overhand strike. So this part of it is probably um, needs to be reevaluated. The athismos as reverse tug of war concept is one that's there. And then this was when, we're, when people were trying to grasp how you push an athismos, well, one obvious thing where people seem to struggle against each other is a tug of war. So you can imagine if you look at this, if you sort of change the directionality, that standing like this and you know leaning into each other like this could generate force. The problem is with a tug of war, you're using that rope and this changes everything because the inflexible rope is what's transforming force. So if you actually try to push this way, 
you run into some real problems because hoplites cannot transfer maximum force in this stance. Um, and this stance can't even be maintained as pressure increases. So that, that may seem contradictory, but essentially what happens is you, if you try to push in this stance, you will get crushed forward as more and more force comes in and you'll find your chest crushed into your shield or as happened to Gianni once, you might find your butt sitting in your shield if you get forced the other way. So this is actually a, a really dangerous way to try to push in a crowd. What we came up with is a concept of essentially a thismos as crowd disaster. And this may seem similar to the rugby um, scheme, but it's actually quite different. And the implications are different. So for instance, this is a crowd disaster in, in Dusseldorf and many people were crushed to death um, they were asphyxiated as they were, the pressure on their bodies, especially on their diaphragms, wouldn't allow them to breathe. Um, and obviously these people have no armor or shields, but uh, even if they had flat shields, they would still be squished together like this and um, unable to breathe. And interestingly, one of the places we see uh, a number of writers use the term of thismos and related terms is when describing crowds moving through gates, sort of just like this. So even to the ancients, this concept of a thismos was something that could occur in sort of a crowd disaster. The concept of a thismos as crowd disaster being weaponized is actually not something that was only known to the ancients. This little picture here, unfortunately, is a timely photograph because this is uh, the Euromaidan in 2014. And here we had um, riot police pushing into crowds, essentially forming a, 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 a sort of low power of thismos to force their way into these, these uh, crowded situations. And the protesters resisted by linking arms. Uh, the level of force generated in a crowd like this, of course, it's limited because uh, everybody's vulnerable to asphyxiation. This was, I took this sort of almost like a personal challenge. This was a, a great statement. It, it said, it's by uh, Goldsworthy in his um, 97 paper on Thismos. It said, should it be proved that a Thismos really was a contest of mass shoving? Then this conclusion would gain importance outside of that it possessed in the context of Greece, hit, Greek history. It would be necessary to explain how Greeks were able to fight in this unique way and why they did. And I think I have the answer. And that is, Greeks have a rather particular shield. The shape of the shield is atypical and it's not something really seen uh, directly modeled in other cultures. Uh, if we look at the position that you would stand in while you're spear fencing on the left there, you can see that your shield is up in front of you. Your shields could be overlapping and fighting over the top of your shield. When we move into a thismos, the shield comes back against the chest. And because you're in this crowd, you're crushed into this position anyway. You can't not form this position. So you get crushed into this position, but because the shield covers you from the upper chest down to the thigh, it spans over your diaphragm. Because it spans over your diaphragm, you can stand like this for extended periods of time and not suffocate. And so this essentially becomes almost like a life preserver that protects you against asphyxiation. And here's another quote I can falsify because it was directed at me. And then this was by uh, Chris Matthews, and it's Matthew in his Storm of Spears. Contrary to Bardinger's conclusions, the bulk of the aspis would make it impossible for the members of a phalanx to crowd each other. Both the shield and the individual would un or be unlikely to withstand such pressures. And this was a secondary challenge now to actually test this. So luckily we were able to. In 2015, at the Archeon Dromena reenactment event at Marathon in Greece, I was there with Giannis and a lot of other reenactors and we affixed a force meter to a tree, which couldn't be pushed back obviously. And then we had men line up and file and push against this force meter. And if we, had, we had lines of up to 10 or 12, and then we had multiple lines of seven. And in one of the bouts of multiple lines of seven, we achieved our maximum force, which was about 368 kilopons of force, or about, it's about 811 pounds on your back, or about 3,690 newtons of force. And if we look at the graph of this force, 
This is now not maximum force, but this is the average force transfer over a uh, about a minute period of time. Basically, it was how long it took my uh, scale to uh, stabilize, but it was about a minute time. And the what we see here is a clear trend in that the top line, the darker line, is this crowd-like pushing that I had them do. And you can see that the amount of force added by each new man decreases. What that means is there's, a, there's inefficiency in pushing through a line of men. And you can sort of make out deflection points, like around four is your sort of basic, uh, where your line is first starting to change its slope. And then somewhere around eight, it starts to plateau. If we continue this out to about maybe let's say 12, 16, we might've seen a true plateau where the new men adding are adding less than, let's say five pounds per man. And this explains why at a battle like Lutra, you could have a giant mass of 50 Thebans fighting 12 Spartans in file, and you could actually have a valid battle because above a certain point, you're not adding that much more, more uh, force to the push. Remember, this force is being added by people who are essentially standing and leaning on each other. It's not, it's not a muscular pushing force because you, you're stood up in the crowd. You can't really push as much as just lean against the person in front of you. And this concept of this plateau, I think clearly explains why we see um, somewhat parity between the Theban and the Spartan forces, even though it also explains why the Thebans eventually won. And that is the numerous ranks behind those first 12, 16 ranks essentially act as a wall. So it's easy for the, uh, it might be easier for the Spartans to push back the 16 ranks, but once they start to push them back, they meld with the rest of the crowd and you end up with a huge mass that they're forcing against. So over time, it would be sort of the equivalent of the Spartans trying to push uphill. Eventually they're worn down. Uh, it does, I think, explain why we see these super deep phalanxes. Well, I had some people tell me, you're, you're pushing against a tree. Maybe that can't happen in real life. So I was lucky enough again to uh, get together with a group in 2019, the Western Martial Arts Workshop in Racine, Wisconsin. And we were able to get a bunch of people together. Now, these unfortunately don't have proper ass speedies, but they do have a uh, slightly smaller, still convex rotella. And we were here able to generate a maximum of around 675 pounds of force, 306 kilopounds of force. Uh, I think the difference is has more to do actually with our shields than with our men, because one of the things that happened is the aspis is so nice, it fits right on your shoulder and on your thigh, neither of which can be squished. So you could stand there for long periods of time, at this most, and we did, it's not a big deal at all. The, the shields are creaking and stuff but no shields were ever broken and no men were ever hurt when we did this. Here, it's a little bit different because these smaller rotella sort of cut into your abdomen. So you can still breathe, but they literally squish your abdomen. You feel your blood pressure rise. So I think a lot of us sort of pulled out of the push here a little earlier. We could probably have gotten even higher with proper speeds here. All right. I promise you shield walls. So I want to talk a little bit about shield walls and how everything I just described to you sort of comes together to show what may have happened at the tail. I had a paper a couple of years back that I defined the functions of shield walls. And there are three major functions that shield walls can do. They can act as a barricade behind which other troops can throw or shoot missiles. They can act as a bastion from which troops can run out and attack um, and then run back behind or they can physically just move forward and attack. And that's what I define as a bludgeon function. If we look at this barricade function, we see this is primarily what's happening in, for instance, ancient Assyria. With the Achmenids, we see the same thing, these large walls of shields um, that are sometimes even stood up on kickstands behind which people are shooting arrows. But we also see this in other places. For instance, I think the Archians, the Archians at the same time are doing this and they have this weird shield with a strap that would allow them to hold it up for a long period of time. And then we have the hoplites. And hoplites have a special shield too. This poor Pax, one of the things it does, probably the thing it does the best, and the reason I think it was designed, 
is because it allows you to stand for a long time with that shield on your shoulder. And, uh, or I shouldn't say on your shoulder, on in front of you. Um, I'd want to point out that in fact, it doesn't actually rest on your shoulder. So you can rest it on your shoulder, but you don't actually have to. You hang it from your arm like this for a long period of time. And if we examine that famous quote from Tertius, and he says, and ye light arm crouch ye on either hand beneath the shield and fling your great hurl stones or throw against them your smooth javelins in your place beside the men of heavier armament. If we read that not as them infiltrating between the ranks all the way to the front line, which they, they could do, but it makes a lot more sense to me at least, if what we're looking at here is one of these same barrier type or barricade type shield walls where you have your richer, heavier armed men up front and you have your poorer men behind. That's a standard war band model that we'll see you know, in many cultures. If we just look at it as that, then really the hoplites are no different than all of these other Near Eastern people. And they're essentially using the same uh, tactics it's slightly different because we know, for instance, these early hoplites all threw spears too. So they were essentially part of the missile component of the uh, of this barricade as well, and that's possible. And then they could fall off, fall off, and you know, hoplites could charge off and fight, and then run back into the mass too. These early sort of primitive shield walls are very versatile. If we look at some other examples of later barricade shield walls. We have uh, the Roman fulcum here on the left, which is described in excellent detail in Mar Maurice's Strategicon. And he specifically tells you that you form up in this multi-tiered formation here with superimposed shields if your men aren't armored and don't have greaves. And that I think is a key because the hoplites, at least the front rank, probably did have greaves, right? So you can, you can see why hoplites can form in a shield wall like this that's still relatively invulnerable to missiles coming in to protect lighter troops behind them, um, even without this sort of multi uh, superimposed shield wall that they had later. The other place you see a sort of primitive shield wall like this, which does a lot of these different functions is amongst the Saxons, their skilled wall or board wheel, and the Norse and their Schalborg. And here is a perfect example off the Bayou Tapestry where you can see that you have um, men in some form of a shield wall, and maybe it overlaps, maybe it doesn't, that's debatable, but they seem to be throwing spears themselves and behind them are at least one archer and a man throwing an ax here, right? And there are men holding extra spears. So this is a essentially a missile uh, firing and protecting formation, which is what I defined as a barricade function. If we look at the comparative range of missiles, though, between the Achmenids and the Greeks, we have a huge disparity. And that is the Achmenids have a, a advanced system of archery where they're shooting uh, in, if not volleys, just massed archery. Um, and the, their bows are very good. So they have a, a you know, rather far reaching archery. The Greeks, on the other hand, at this point, if they were even backed by archers, would have been backed by archers using self bows. So they would have had a, a, a much uh, more limited range. And of course, if they were using um, heavy rocks and or uh, javelins, that would even be less so. Slings, on the other hand, could, could range pretty far, but obviously that was uh, uh, not the major component of the siloid behind these Greeks if they formed, as I suggest. So we see a, a problem and this disparity <coughs> in missile component of their shield walls, I think plays out in the introduction of two things in the late sixth century. One is the shield apron, and that is a leather or textile um, sheet that hangs off of the shield to help protect the legs. And we see this probably first in Ionia, and it, this is a uh, Clasmenian sarcophagus. The date is unclear, but it could be as early as 510. And here you can clearly see this um, shield apron. And this actually works fairly well. We've tested this and it does actually stop missiles, uh, especially missiles that are sort of spent and at range. Um, the other thing that we see coming in in the 65th Olympiad, about 520, is the hoplitodromos, which is the run in armor. And now, so 
On the left, we have a means of standing in this line still and, and engaging in this missile duel. But I think we're seeing a trend here with this Hoplita Dromos that at least they're giving some thought to the fact that running through this missile range may be a better option. And you can see here, for instance, if you have your comparative range of missiles and you're wildly at range, the best thing you could do, of course, is run in and get close to your opponents. And then when you get close to your opponents, you're actually beneath the range of their um, arrows. Because one of the problems with that, it has to be shot at a, uh, a parabolic curve. So if you're gonna shoot over your front ranks, you have a dead zone right in front of those front ranks that you can't reach. And the only way you could reach them would be to sort of step up and aim over the shoulders or heads of the men in front of you. And clearly all of the ranks can't do that. So at best you'd be getting one rank of archers shooting at you once you get past that range at which the massed volleys are most effective. So there's a lot of pressure for hoplites to do this. Um, and this has been suggested by Prince and others that this happened. This is one of the reasons we see these long runs begin like at marathon. And I think this played out in real time at Plataea, where you have the men standing under missile fire until one, you know, motivated Tajian takes off, and then they all go. And once they get to this range, they're much more protected from the missile fire. But one thing that happens when you are running like this through the beaten zone of enemy missiles is you no longer need your own missile component because it's useless. So uh, Krentz had suggested that they, they essentially rearmed all of their light troops as heavier troops to you know, take advantage of this. And that is a possibility. But I think one of the other problems that we see here for Greek history is that they abandon their light troops because essentially there's a contract in this kind of shield wall where I'm protecting you behind me and you have to protect me from the enemy missiles. And this, is, this represents a failure of some sort of a social contract between the heavies and the lights. And I'm not gonna go too far into that, but I think maybe keep that in mind when we're trying to understand how uh, the Greeks would later treat light troops, is that when they needed the most in a sense here, they were essentially failed by their own light troops. One thing that happens is when your own light troops are trying to fight behind you, you cannot be too deep. So as long as you were in a, in a shield wall that required you to be in front of and protecting and screening light troops, you probably only could get to about eight ranks deep, which is what we're told by Scudipodotus. Um, Xenophon also makes mention of the fact that the missile troops being behind ranks of their own men greatly hampers them. And one of the reasons for this is you can imagine if each man only held up, uh, you know, occupied a meter of space, let's say, well, then your own missile troops are eight meters behind your leading element. So he's obviously not well protected. So I'm gonna end on this and just mention that I think what we're seeing on the field of Plataea is a situation where you have a sort of mixed shield wall. One of the functions of it is a, uh, a barricade encountering a shield wall, which has become greatly tailored towards this uh, barricade style fighting uh, in the Persians. And then the answer to that was essentially not to make a better barricade, but to move the whole concept of Greek combat more towards that bludgeon phase. And I think that's where we see the major change uh, before and after the Persian Wars is they will essentially abandon that integral uh, component of missile troops in favor of this charge and this flat out bludgeoning. Now I should point out that in a mixed hoplite phalanx all going all the way back to the archaic, they didn't just throw things over the top of their ranks and throw spears at each other. They always ended in some kind of a bludgeon match. But here we see it becoming essentially the primary function. Thank you guys.